In the previous episode, we went over the first few days of the battle for Hampton Roads. The mighty Ironclads fought it out and the battle ended in a bit of a stalemate. Now, for part five of the Ironclads of the Civil War series, let's get into what happened to the Ironclads after their first confrontation and what, if anything, could finally take down these super weapons. Hello and welcome to the Spark History Show, where we bring history to light. Take a dive with us into history and hear the real accounts of the stories of the past as they actually unfolded. Explore with us as we shine some light on the amazing events that shaped our world into what we have today. We are going to recreate the stories of the past to better understand the struggles and triumphs during the most epic moments in history. This is the Spark History Show. Let us begin the journey. Days started to go by without either the Monitor or the Virginia crossing into each other's territory. Union ground forces under General McClellan were now moving up the York River to head to Richmond and take out the Confederate capital. The city of Richmond was in the direction of northwest from the point where the Virginia sat at her moorings. Top Confederate leaders tried to decide what the next plan for the Virginia should be. By staying put near Hampton Roads, the ship remained a threat to the Union and helped to prevent them from advancing further south. The Union would also have to leave the Monitor in the area as a check against the Confederate ironclad and it could not assist with Union operations elsewhere. At one point, orders came down that the Virginia was to sneak out under the cover of night and head to the York River to be of assistance in the defense of Richmond. But as the ship went under steam, a signal came from shore instructing the vessel to fall back to its original location. And they once again waited. The crew began to grow restless with the inaction. The vessel was not built for comfort, and there was poor ventilation. To get some type of exercise and fresh air, the crew would try and walk outside along the deck to stretch their legs, but overall it was a very uncomfortable living. The crewmen yearned for action. They wanted to once again go head to head with the Monitor for another chance to take out their enemy and prove they were superior. But they would not be able to have their way. The superiors in the Confederacy did not want to foolishly throw away their one advantage on the sea in a desperate strike for a small possible gain. To defend Richmond, the Confederate ground forces were forced to withdraw from the area around Norfolk and pull back to Richmond's defenses. Remember, Richmond was the Confederate capital at the time and needed to be defended for strategic and morale purposes. On May 3rd, 1862, the order was given to evacuate the key port area of Norfolk and work began to dismantle what was left of the machinery and tools of war that could be used by the Union after the evacuation. Around May 5th, the Union president himself, Abraham Lincoln, made his way to Hampton Roads along with an entourage of advisors. He was able to catch a glimpse of the Virginia firsthand and review the current situation with the Union naval leaders in person aboard the USS Minnesota. There, a plan was devised with the President, the Advisors, and Rear Admiral Goldsboro for the next plan of action. It is important to note that at this point in time, another Union ironclad ship called the Galena had been constructed and brought down to Hampton Roads. The ship was commissioned in April of 1862 after being built in Connecticut and it was sent to the roads immediately to aid in the defense against the Virginia. Although this was now the second Union ironclad, it was not structured in a similar manner as the Monitor. It had a more traditional design and looked more like a standard steamship. The inside of the ship was built on a strong wooden frame and then thin iron armor was placed along the hull to protect it from enemy projectiles. The armor was much thinner than the design which had been used on the Monitor, which had been purposely created to counter the Confederate ironclad. The famous industrialist Cornelius Vanderbilt also donated his very own ship to the war effort, duly named the Vanderbilt, to assist the Union in the fight against the Virginia. The large cruiser was outfitted with a heavy ram with the hope that with so much mass behind the large ship, if they were able to ram the Virginia with their great speed and weight, they would sink the enemy vessel. All the ships were prepared and ready for the next engagement. 
Unbeknownst to the Union forces, the South had also been constructing their second ironclad ship in the Norfolk Navy Yard. The new ship was named Richmond, after the Confederate capital. The vessel was not yet finished, but in a daring move, the Confederates risked the ship to try and sneak up the river to the city of Richmond on May 6th. Since the area of construction in Norfolk was being evacuated, they did not want to risk the vessel falling into enemy hands. The same day that it was put into the sea from dry dock, two of the Virginia's escort ships that we had spoken about earlier, the Jamestown and Patrick Henry, managed to secretly tow the ship up the James River under the cover of darkness to reach Richmond, where later construction would be completed. With the new plan to attack the South's defenses after the meeting with the president, the Union Navy moved out on May 8th for battle. The fleet sailed across Hampton Roads and began to engage the Confederate shore batteries on Seawalls Point at the mouth of the Elizabeth River. This is the river that led to the Gosport Navy Yard and also deeper into the South's territory. Cannon fire erupted as both sides let loose with their cannons. The Virginia had been in port further down the Elizabeth River and didn't realize a fight had erupted until smoke began to appear over the horizon from the fires on the buildings near the shore batteries. Everyone on the Virginia threw down what they were doing and prepped the ship to steam into Hampton Roads. Fully up to steam, the ship then pushed north, hoping to confront the Union ironclad once again. By the time the Virginia was entering the area of Hampton Roads, it was 2.45 p.m. Just before the ship was able to get in range of the monitor, Union Admiral Goldsboro ordered the Federal ships to fall back, and they retreated back to the safety of Fort Monroe. Tattnall and the crew of the Virginia were once again dismayed that the Union Navy would not engage them. The Confederates were not going to move in under the gun range of Fort Monroe and wanted the enemy that was so sure of themselves to engage them out on the open water. The Virginia circled in the roads for another hour, hoping that the Union ships would steam out to engage her as an enticing target. But the Union Navy stayed put. Similar to what they had done before, the Virginia once again fired at the enemy with one shot in defiance, but they were completely out of range of the Union Navy, and then they simply retreated back to home. The Virginia maintained her position near the South stronghold of Seawells Point at the mouth of the Elizabeth River into Hampton Roads for the next few days. Everything seemed to be going as a normal day on May 10th aboard the ship. Everyday morning routines were performed. The men went about their business. But then, as the day went on, the crew noticed that the Confederate flag was not flying on the flag mast of the nearby Seawells Point anymore. The ship tried to signal from their position to the garrison, but their calls were left unanswered. Lieutenant Jones of the Virginia was sent by the captain to go to Craney Island by small boat, where a Confederate flag was still flying to determine what happened at Seawells Point. Speaking with the garrison, Jones discovered that the Union had launched a surprise landing onto the South's territory with a full four regiments of infantry, which then proceeded to start moving south to attack the naval yard in Norfolk. The Confederate troops in Seawells Point had evacuated when they heard the news of the Union's infantry's arrival in the morning. In a grave error which was maybe made due to the haste of the situation, the commanders on the ground had not signaled during the evacuation to the Virginia when they were leaving. This left the Virginia with no knowledge of the troop withdrawal. The Virginia was now put in a tough bind, as she now had Union forces on both sides of her, and the nearby Confederate army at Seawell's Point that had been supporting her was now gone. Expressing greater and greater concern after receiving the news from Lieutenant Jones once he was back aboard the Virginia, Captain Tattnall then sent Jones to Norfolk to ascertain the status of the city and what role the Virginia should have in the current situation. By the time Jones got to Norfolk, all of the Confederate forces had already left the city and had set the key strategic buildings ablaze in their evacuation. The Union Army had advanced to the outskirts of the city. Jones set out again for the Virginia to deliver the news. While he was on his journey, the Union forces gained control of Norfolk and the Naval Yard that afternoon, and the Confederate forces on Craney Island had also decided to evacuate. Jones arrived to the Virginia with the news, and the Virginia was left with no shore batteries or aid from nearby land forces, a reinforced Union Navy on the other side of Hampton Roads, and Union forces taking control of the land behind them that they had been using as a safe port. The ship was effectively 
surrounded. The time was now around 7 p.m. on May 10th, and Tadnell knew that they had to do something or risk being trapped in their current position with no help or support. The decision was made to try and make a run up the James River to Richmond and to safety. In order to make the voyage, the ship had to lower its draft, as the route into the James River was very shallow due to the sandbar that formed at the mouth of the river going into Hampton Roads. Orders were given, and the men began to toss all of the non-essential items overboard to lighten the ship. By 2 a.m., the Virginia had been greatly lightened and looked like it could make the voyage up the river and solidify their escape. Then, as has happened so many times in history, the weather changed and completely foiled the ship's plan. The whole time, the wind had been blowing heavily from the east, which meant that the water would be pushed over the sandbar at the end of the river, enabling a ship with a deeper draft to still be able to get through. Now, the wind suddenly shifted to coming in from the west, which meant it would push water away from the sandbar, meaning the sandbar would now be closer to the surface and only a ship with a very shallow draft could pass. The Virginia had been able to knock off several feet from her draft by throwing items overboard. Lowering the draft meant that the ship was actually floating several feet higher in the water, with less of the hull submerged, enabling it to traverse shallower water without hitting the bottom of the seabed. The issue with this was that even with the adjustments that they made to the ship, the wind change meant that they would not be able to get the ship over the now shallower sandbar. The pilots informed the captain of the predicament, and Captain Tattnall was put in another tough bind. Since all of the extra weight from the ship had been removed, the ship was now sitting much higher in the water than originally planned, and the soft underbelly of the ship would now be visible to the enemy. Remember, the iron casemate had originally only covered a small amount below the water level, and now that the wooden part of the hull was exposed, a Union ship could easily punch a hole below the waterline and sink the Virginia. They had basically negated the iron armor of the ship by lessening the draft. The rudder and propeller, which were normally submerged and covered by water, were now visible and also susceptible to enemy fire. It was a solemn day for Tattnall. The new commander of the Virginia had never gotten a chance to fight one-on-one with the Monitor and now had to make the tough decision to order the ship to be scuttled rather than fall into enemy hands. They were now combat ineffective with their wooden hull exposed and were surrounded on all sides by the enemy. The one plan to escape up the James River had been thwarted by the weather. The only option left to prevent the ship from eventually falling into the Union's hands was to abandon the ship and destroy it themselves. The once mighty ironclad would be coming to a bitter end. Tattnall ordered the ship to steam toward Craney Island. After evacuating the ship on foot, the men could then head from the island toward other Confederate troops in Suffolk, Virginia. After counsel with his officers, there was a unanimous decision to scuttle the ship. When the Virginia approached the island, they went in full steam and ran the ship aground along the shoreline of the island. From the shallow waters, boats were then used to ferry the men and supplies that could be taken from the ship onto the island. It took several hours for all of the 300 men to be safely transported to shore. Lieutenant Jones and gunner Captain Wood then rigged the ship for demolition and started the slow-burning fires that would eventually ignite all the powder on the ship, causing it to explode. Jones and Wood then also proceeded to shore. The officers and crew began to march away as the ship started to burn. As the crew of the Virginia marched away from the ship, the sounds of individual guns erupting on the Virginia sounded as the blaze on board the ship engulfed the cannons one by one and caused the ordnance to ignite. Eventually, by around 5 a.m., the fire had reached the main powder store on the ship. The crew, still marching away, then heard the sound of the giant blast as the entire powder store of the ship erupted and sent out a shockwave and sound of the explosion for miles. The crew members, now marooned on land instead of being on the sea, knew that their lovely ironclad that had been the pride of the Confederacy was no more. The demolition of the Virginia had been completed. Now that we know how the Virginia met her final demise, what ended up happening to the first Union ironclad, the Monitor? The Monitor would actually live to see some additional action. 
That night of May 10th, the fire set on board the Virginia reflected off the night sky from the distance and made the Union Navy speculate that the Confederates were scuttling their ironclad. The loud explosion also gave further confirmation that the ship had been destroyed. When morning came around, the Union forces were able to visibly see that the Virginia had been run aground and scuttled. Orders were immediately set out to the Union Navy to advance as the Confederates no longer had the ironclad protecting their waterways. The Monitor, as well as a host of other ships, including the Baltimore, which was carrying President Abraham Lincoln, departed their moorings and headed up the Elizabeth River to the newly held port at Norfolk. With the port and Norfolk strongly secured and the Confederates forced to retreat from the area, the Union then turned their sights on Richmond. Without the enemy ironclad in their way, the Monitor and the other new iron armored ship, the Galena, as well as three additional ships, went about sailing up the James River to put pressure on the Confederate stronghold of Richmond. The Monitor passed by the smoking hulk of their once valiant enemy, the Virginia, and some regretted that they were not able to take her head on and defeat her directly in battle. But it would be on the River James that the Monitor would once again engage in a fight. The Confederates knew that without the Virginia protecting the river, the Union forces would surely use the water passageway to their advantage for an attack on Richmond. In response to this threat, the Confederates sunk a number of obstructions in the river to prevent safe passage of enemy vessels. The obstructions were placed by a point of land called Drury's Bluff, and were mainly comprised of small naval ships such as schooners and sloops that were purposely sunk in the channel of the river, blocking passage. Drury's Bluff, which was called Fort Darling by the Union forces, was situated in a good spot overlooking a bend in the river. With the obstructions in place, the South also placed heavy cannon batteries on Drury's Bluff to defend the position. It took several days for the Union Navy to advance to this point, but on May 15th they arrived at Drury's Bluff. The Union ship Galena steamed into the area, followed by the Monitor, which was still captained by William Nicholson Jeffers. As soon as they were in rage, the Confederate positions on the nearby shore opened fire on the ships. The crew of the Virginia had actually marched across land all the way to this location and manned some of the Confederate shore batteries. Despite their exhaustion, the Virginia's crew was glad to finally have the chance to attack the Monitor, even though it was from land instead of their own ship. The river narrowed in the area around Drury's Bluff, and with the obstructions the Confederates placed, the Union ships had to try and move through a narrow passageway, which could be covered with fire from the enemy shore batteries. The fighting started when the Union ships moved into the area around 7.30 a.m. on May 15th. Since the Galena was out in front, she ended up taking the brunt of the Confederate attack. The Galena threw everything they had at the shore batteries, firing their cannons for hours on end, but the shore batteries would not be silenced and continued to fire on the Galena. The Confederate gunners noticed that the iron side of the Galena started to buckle and crack until some shots were actually penetrating into the ship. This was a nice sight for the Confederates, who now began to focus all of their fire on the struggling Galena while ignoring the monitor, looking to capitalize on the situation. After hours of fighting, at around 11 a.m., signal flags began to be raised on board the Galena to contact the other Union vessels. The Confederate troops strained to see the flags and interpret what they could mean. It was speculated that maybe a shot had penetrated to a vital spot on the Galena, or maybe she was sinking and was requesting assistance from her fellow Navy men. The Galena started to pull out of the fight at this time their ammunition running low, and the casualties on board the ship increasing with the severely damaged iron armor. Enemy fire was now breaking through the hull of the ship and causing severe damage. The Monitor tried to move forward to block the fire from the shore batteries to the Galena and bear down on the land position with their own cannons, but they ran into an issue. The guns on the Monitor had been sighted to fire along the waterline at enemy ships, and were not positioned in a way that they could be brought to bear on an upward trajectory at the shore batteries, which were at a much higher elevation. Not being able to effectively use her guns, the Monitor decided to fall back along with the Galena. The Confederate troops continued to focus fire on the Galena for as long as they could before she was out of range. The Monitor ended the battle with only three hits from the enemy cannons due to the enemy largely ignoring her for the easier prey of the Galena. 
Because of the focus fire, the Galena did not fare so well in the battle. The iron armor of the ship had been completely compromised by the successive impacts from enemy shells. With the compromised iron now providing incomplete protection, the Galena had been turned into just another wooden hulled ship which would sustain heavy casualties engaging a defensive position along a shoreline. Once the shells got through the armor, they ended up killing 13 sailors and wounding another 11. Unlike the Monitor, in the first four-hour fight for the second Union iron-armored ship, the Galena had failed as an ironclad. The lighter style of armor that was used was just not enough protection to prevent penetration of the hull by enemy cannons. Although the Monitor did alright in this battle and was relatively unscathed, Captain Jeffers as well as the crew of the ship started to discover more and more faults with the ship, the first being that it could not aim up at a land target and also that it was very difficult for communication and aiming to work between the separate pilot house and the turret of the ship. The crew was also dismayed at seeing how hot it could become in the iron box, with temperatures reaching up to 140 degrees Fahrenheit in the turret. To give you an idea of how hot that is, 10 or 20 degrees hotter, and they could be making their own scrambled eggs on the iron. How about a little breakfast with that battle? Although the Monitor, for propaganda reasons, was heralded as the harbinger of the end of wooden ships and an undefeatable vessel, it was really an experimental design with many flaws that would need to be improved in later iterations. The two northern ironclads had retreated to a place called City Point along the James River, away from the Confederate batteries. Here, they rearmed and performed basic repairs. The obstructions placed in the water by the Confederates prevented the ships from advancing further up the James River to reach and bombard Richmond to support their land forces, as was the original plan. The Monitor ended up staying in this position for the next few months. Keep in mind that this was now the hot period of the summer as May rolled into June, July, and August. We spoke previously about the crazy temperatures it would reach inside the ship. Trying to engage in a major battle under the intense heat conditions during the summer months would take a toll on the men. Many of the crew during the summer would even sleep above decks to get away from the heat and mosquitoes which now made a home in the underbelly of the ship. The warship was not made for comfort. Jeffers was relieved of command of the Monitor and replaced by temporary Captain John P. Bankhead. The crew had not been happy with Jeffers' performance and was glad to see him go. There was a feeling that he had been all talk but short on action. The Monitor was ordered to steam to Washington, D.C. to undergo full repairs on September 30th, 1862. Arriving to D.C. on October 3rd, the Monitor was scheduled for a number of repairs and enhancements. She ended up becoming a bit of an attraction as the citizens in the capital city finally got to go down to the docks and see the Union ironclad in person. Many were eager to see the Union superweapon, a marvel of new technology. During the repairs, areas that had indentations in the armor caused by enemy fire were covered with iron plates and were marked with what caused them, such as Merrimack or Merrimack's prow. After six weeks of being in the port, the ship then steamed back to Newport News, Virginia. As you can see, there had been a lot of sitting around for the monitor and not so much action. Engineers worked to help reduce some of the inherent flaws found in the ship, and the Union Navy had also chartered the building of a series of Monitor-class ironclad ships to strengthen their Navy. After the original battle to stop the Confederate Virginia, the ship needed a new mission. The Union blockade was now holding with the fall of the Virginia. Eager to get back out to the action, the crew of the Monitor was elated when orders finally came to proceed south to Beaufort, North Carolina to assist in the naval blockade of the South. Maybe they could once again show their worth in combat. The orders were received on December 25th, and on December 29th the Monitor set out under tow from fellow Navy ship the USS Rhode Island. The first day out at sea for the Monitor went smoothly, with clear skies all around. But the second day, things began to get gloomy. Dark clouds began moving in from the south and west. A storm seemed to be brewing. Keep in mind, this was way before the time where weather could be accurately predicted like it can be today. Or semi-accurately, I should say. 
There was no looking up on your mobile phone the weather for the next week to determine if it was a safe time for a sea voyage. Weather could be one of the greatest threats to a ship on the open ocean with no protection from the harsh wind and waves. Even today, storms pose a serious threat to seafaring vessels. I think we know where this story is heading. Things got worse for the monitor as the afternoon turned into evening. A storm had arrived, and with it, the wind and waves had turned into a fury. The monitor was not built for steaming through heavy seas. It was built for engaging and beating an enemy ironclad in close quarters, most likely in a protected area or bay. The extremely low deck, which gave it a small profile of attack to an enemy warship, also meant that waves kicking up from the storms began flying over the deck of the monitor and crashing on top of the vessel due to its low height. It quickly became unsafe for any of the crew to be outside of the hull of the ship, and everyone went inside and buttoned down their hatches to avoid being swept away by the waves. As the sea continued to have larger and larger swells, the monitor began to be tossed about in the storm. In a jet ski or speedboat of today, you have a hull that is shaped like a knife, kind of like a triangle with the point facing down towards the water, which can cut through the waves very easily and offer the least resistance. Even with this design, when you are going fast and the bow of the boat picks up out of the water and then comes crashing back down into the surf, you can feel the jolt. If you dive off a diving board and belly flop into the water, you can feel the force of the impact the water creates on your skin. This force of the water in its extreme was pounding against the monitor as it was tossed around by the waves of the storm. A wave would come in and push up the bow of the monitor as the ship would push to power over the crest of the swell, also known as the top of the wave. Then the wave would push through underneath the ship and finally the monitor would top the crest of the water and then for a brief moment potentially have the bow of the ship suspended above the water. As gravity took back control, the bow would start to dip downwards toward the lower trough of the wave, and with gravity pulling it down, the ship would slide down over the last bit of the wave flowing underneath and smack hard back into the water. The full force of the impact rattling the ship and causing water to spray over the bow of the vessel. The storm was relentless, and wave after wave punished the ship, pushing it around violently in the sea. There were two distinct parts in the design of the monitor, the upper hull and the lower hull. The force of the ship smashing back into the water started to cause the link between the upper and lower hull to buckle. Pretty soon, leaks sprung out all over the ship. The pumps on board the ship were fired up as the crew tried to expel the water that started filling the hull. They were pumping out over 3,000 gallons a minute of water from the ship, and yet the water level inside the vessel continued to rise. Crewmen grabbed buckets and started a bucket line to slowly scoop out the water and dump it out of the ship to assist the pumps. The officers sent up a distress signal to the USS Rhode Island, which was still towing their vessel, that they were in distress and needed her to come alongside for support. When the Rhode Island tried to reposition closer to the monitor, the tow line got in her way. Seeing the issue, the crew of the monitor knew that they had to remove the tow line from the front of the ship to allow the Rhode Island to assist the troubled ironclad. Three men braved the storm and dashed out onto the deck to try and cut away the tow line with hatchets. They climbed towards the bow, holding on for dear life, as the ship tossed and turned in the sea, with water splashing over the sides. All of a sudden, a giant wave comes and knocks two of the men clear off the deck of the ship and into the sea, never to be seen again. The last man managed to reach the bow and began hacking away furiously at the 13 inches of tow line rope holding the ships together. The last man braces himself firmly and holds on tight and then begins to chop, chop, chop away at the tow line. The water is crashing over the bow of the ship, drenching him, trying to break him free from his grip. But he continues to hold on with all of his strength. After an exhaustive effort, he finishes cutting through the line and it separates from the ship, dropping into the sea. More signals and flares went up to ask the Rhode Island for assistance and to send lifeboats, but it seemed like the ship was not responding. They may have been having their own trouble from the storm, but the crew of the monitor had no way of knowing and were themselves in a desperate situation. 
The men in the lower engine room were now wading through water a foot deep as they tried to keep the engine functioning and the bucket lines operational. The water continued to rise higher and higher. They just couldn't stop it. Now it was inches away from reaching the fires in the engine furnace and disabling the entire steam propulsion of the entire ship. The water pumps were pumping at full capacity. The men were furiously passing buckets full of water to be dumped out of the hull. But it still was not enough. The water soon reached and extinguished the fires in the furnace, and the ship was left dead in the water with no power. This was a dangerous position, as the ship could not be maneuvered to lessen the impact of the smashing waves. To help prevent the ship from being turned over in the rough seas while they had no propulsion, Captain Bankhead ordered the anchor to be dropped. The anchor was let loose, but this ended up jerking the entire ship downward as it settled into the seabed and caught hold. This force of the anchor jarring the ship caused more leaks to spring up in all the creases of the vessel due to the force of the impact exerted on all joints of the ship. The crewmen now evacuated to the turret at the top of the ship to escape the interior of the hull which was plunged into darkness as the lanterns went out and rooms quickly filled with seawater. Finally, through the choppy seas the men sighted a lifeboat approaching from the Rhode Island. The men got ready to make their escape to the lifeboat. It would be a perilous journey. The crew would have to climb down the ladder from the turret and then make their way across the open deck with nothing to hold on to and then jump into the lifeboat alongside the ship. All as the sea tossed and turned both vessels back and forth. As the lifeboat moved into position, the Rhode Island had also been working to try and close the distance between them and the monitor. Starting to get a little too close, they lost some of their maneuverability with the large swells, and the ship almost smashed into the small lifeboat between them and the monitor, which could have pancaked the boat in between the two heavy vessels splintering apart the tiny lifeboat. Luckily, the Rhode Island was able to somewhat regain control and pull back away from the monitor a bit. Men began making their way to the lifeboat along the top deck of the monitor. Wave after wave splashed over the sides of the ship, and many men lost their footing and were swept completely overboard. For those that could not quickly swim back to the ship, it meant certain death, as there was no way for them to keep their heads above water in the rough seas. There would be no saving them as the mighty waves pulled them farther away and dunked them into the sea and out of sight. A second lifeboat came alongside the monitor near the turret, and men desperately jumped, trying to make the leap into the small boat from the turret. Some misjudged their leap and the motion caused by the waves and ended up plunging into the sea, missing the lifeboat entirely. Captain Bankhead himself had tried to make it to a lifeboat when a wave washed him overboard. Luckily, he was close enough to the lifeboat after being washed into the water that the crew was able to haul him in over the side of the vessel. The last visible survivors on the monitor were on the turret with their arms firmly tightened around the dying ship, refusing to move. After seeing their crewmates plunge to their death of drowning in the ocean after missing the jump to the nearby lifeboat, they thought it best to stay on the sinking ironclad. The men on the lifeboats tried to get them to abandon the ship, but they refused to leave. The illusion of safety they had found on the monitor's turret was just too strong for them to try a risky escape. Unfortunately, after trying their best to persuade the rest of the crew of the monitor to join them, the lifeboats had to turn away and head back to the Rhode Island before an unlucky wave could take out their own smaller vessel and chances of rescue. Getting from the lifeboats onto the larger steamer Rhode Island was no easy task. The lifeboats tried to carefully come up alongside the ship, but the sea was so rough it tossed the lifeboat into the ship and then pulled them away again. The crew members desperately grasped for lines which were thrown off the side of the steamer which they used to pull themselves up, climbing alongside the hull of the larger vessel. Those that were injured had to have lines tied around them and be hoisted up to the deck of the steamer. In the struggle, the doctor from the monitor, Dr. Weeks, had left his arm dangling over the side of his lifeboat. A swell brought the lifeboat smacking into the side of the Rhode Island, and the poor doctor's arm was caught between the hull of the ship and the lifeboat. Three of his fingers were crushed and mangled, and his arm dislocated. Just a brutal experience. His fellow crew members were able to get the doctor onto the Rhode Island, 
But once he was on board, his fingers had to be amputated. After the lifeboats had evacuated the crew of the Monitor onto the Rhode Island, they went back to see if they could save any more souls left on the Ironclad. The sea was so rough that each time they got close to the Monitor, the ocean swells kicked them back and away. They finally made it to where the Monitor had been, but by this point, the sea was empty. The only trace that was left of the Monitor was a small circling pool of water indicating where the Monitor had been pulled into the depths. The storm was so intense that the lifeboat was not even able to make it back to the Rhode Island that night. They were lost at sea and were only found once again in the next morning when the skies cleared. On December 31st, 1862 at around 1 a.m., the Monitor ceased to exist. This day marked the end of the Union's first ironclad the mighty ship that had taken on the Confederates' Virginia and saved the Union's blockade of the South ended up being humbled by a storm. We now know today that when the Monitor sank, it spun over with the turret being lodged into the seabed and the hole resting on top of it. It settled into a depth of 220 feet of water about 15 miles out from the coastline. Its final resting place was the Sea of Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. This brings an end to both sides of the Civil War's first ironclads, the CSS Virginia, which was scuttled in Hampton Roads on Craney Island, and the USS Monitor, which was lost at sea off the coast of North Carolina. What these two ships managed to show to the world was that no wooden ship in any navy was safe. In battle, the Virginia proved that an iron-armored ship could easily run through wooden ships while barely sustaining any damage herself. Both the Union and the Confederacy pushed forward with the building of ironclad ships to assist in the war effort. The South commissioned over 50 ironclad vessels to be built, of which 22 made it to service during the remainder of the war. Most of the ships followed a similar design of the original Virginia, as they were planned out by the same architect as on the Virginia, John L. Porter. The fear that the Union had of these ironclads helped keep the South's ports from being engaged directly in battle, as the Union wanted to avoid a direct confrontation with the new type of ship. Throughout the war, the South had little industrial capacity and was always short on supplies, and this hampered their ability to construct additional iron ships. Most of the vessels that were created maintained many of the same weaknesses similar to the original Virginia, with low speed and low maneuverability. On the Union side, the Navy was able to produce another 60 ironclad vessels, which used the Monitor as the prototype, and added features as new strengths and weaknesses were discovered in battles. One of the main features on many of the ships was the inclusion of a rotating turret similar to the Monitor's, which would become a mainstay on all Navy ships through to modern times. As the ship design progressed, the Union started to build ships with up to three separate rotating turrets compared to the Monitor's single turret. The advantage of being able to rotate a turret to a firing position instead of maneuvering the entire ship to align their cannon sights on the enemy was too good to be ignored. Towards the end of the war, the Union ironclads played a key role in tightening the Federal Navy's noose around the Confederate States and then moving in on their seaports. A number of the Union vessels fought and some had even been sunk in battle, but the firepower on the offensive side of the cannons of the time was still found lacking to be able to take on a full ironclad ship directly. The reason why the Monitor and the Virginia, also known as the Merrimack, were so important was that it effectively created the turning point in navies around the world. From that point on, new ship construction focused on only ironclad ships and the older wooden ships currently operating would eventually retire out of service. The engagement in Hampton Roads and the building of additional ironclads throughout the American Civil War proved the worthiness of ironclad ships under the most stressful battle conditions, and they proved it to the world. Remember when the Virginia had been beached and then effectively blown up by the Confederates to prevent it from being used by the Union? Even a ship that is badly damaged contained parts or metal that could still be used for some other purpose. A salvage operation was started in 1868 after the Civil War was over, and the full salvage of the Virginia with the remains of the ship being towed to dry dock was completed in 1874. 
The dry dock that the Virginia was placed in was actually the same one in Norfolk that the Confederates had used to turn her into an ironclad in the first place. She made a round trip back home. Most of the metal was salvaged for other projects, but some of the pieces of the ship would eventually find their way into museums. The Hulk of the Monitor had a different fate than the Virginia. As it was lost in a terrible storm at sea, the exact location of the shipwreck was unknown. For decades, searches for the ship came back empty-handed. Eventually, over a century after the actual sinking of the vessel, a research team located the Monitor off the coast of Cape Hatteras, North Carolina in 1973. It took months to verify that it was actually the remains of the Monitor as the metal was lodged in the seabed and needed to be uncovered. This is where it was discovered that the turret had impacted the seabed first and then the hole had fallen on top of it as the ship had turned upside down as it was sinking and heading into the depths. The issue was that the technology and the cost to potentially raise the monitor to the surface were too great in 1974. It would end up taking until 2002 for an operation to be put underway to raise the ship. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration NOAA for short, as well as a team of U.S. Navy divers had the delicate task of excavating and raising the ship to the surface. During the excavations, the skeletal remains of two of the Union crew members were found still inside the vessel. On August 9th, 2002, the turret to the monitor was raised from the seabed, placed on a barge, and then towed to its new home in the Mariner's Museum in Newport News, Virginia. Inside the Mariner's Museum, a $30 million USS Monitor Center was constructed, consisting of 60,000 square feet of space devoted to the history of the ship as an iconic part of America's past. A separate submersion tank was built to hold the turret of the ship and prevent decay from the air reacting with the middle of the turret. Just as the Monitor had drawn crowds in 1862, the placing of the Monitor's turret into the submersion tank drew a crowd of around 2,000 individuals to be the first to see the 140-year-old relic. If you happen to be passing through the state of Virginia, you can stop by the Mariner's Museum and see artifacts of the time period as well as detailed reconstructions of the ship. During the recovery expedition that was performed, over 200 tons of materials were recovered from where the ship had sunk. Neither of the first ironclad vessels was able to survive the war, but they were just the prototype ship for a new age. Both sides in the war continued to produce additional versions of ironclad ships, which ended up having their own epic battles. But that is a story for another day. There you have it, the story of the first ironclads in the American Civil War, the Union's USS Monitor, and the Confederate CSS Virginia, also known as the Merrimack. These two ships would change the course of history and help bring on the revolution of metal shipbuilding and the retirement of wooden hulled warships throughout the world. Thank you for listening to the Ironclad series. If you made it all the way here to the end after those hours of knowledge being ingested into your brain, come help out our production by subscribing to the show and leaving us a review on iTunes. If the show sparks your curiosity, you can also check out the website at sparkhistory.com and view our other shows and resources. Once again, thank you for listening and have a great day.